so VK on the beat uh -huh. Check uh -huh. I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love oh. I'm from Toronto where you wanna get the city love okay. I'm in Toronto where you wanna get the city love That's right. My city love me back Welcome to episode 1082 of Toronto Miked, proudly brought to you by Great Lakes Brewery, a fiercely independent craft brewery who believes in supporting communities, good times, and brewing amazing beer. Order online for free local home delivery in the GTA. StickerU.com. Create custom stickers, labels, tattoos, and decals for your home and your business. Palma Pasta. Enjoy the taste of fresh, homemade Italian pasta and entrees from Palma Pasta in Mississauga and Oakville. Doer. The world's most comfortable pants and shorts. Save 15% with the promo code TORONTOMIKE. Ridley Funeral Home. Pillars of the community since 1921. And Canna Cabana. The lowest prices on cannabis. Guaranteed. Over 100 stores across the country. Learn more at cannacabana.com. This week, making their Toronto Mike debuts are Jay Malinowski and Eon Sinclair from Bedouin Sound Clash. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having us. We'll start with you, Jay, just geographically speaking. Uh, whereabouts are you in the world right now? I'm in Victoria, BC right now. What's the, what's it like there? What's the weather that like there at uh, this time of year? It's gorgeous, right? <laughs> it is gorgeous today. It's really sunny today. It has, it's been kind of cool this whole summer, but usually it's nice. But yeah, today's nice. It's like 21, de it's like, say it's 21 degrees. You know, you can't go wrong with 21 degrees. Uh, Eon, no. you're a little closer to the TMDS studio here. Whereabouts are you today? I'm in Pickering out in Durham region. Uh, so yeah, not too far from uh, the uh, studio, which I know is in Etobicoke. So I'm sure our weather's pretty similar. It's a little bit overcast today, but it's not, it, it's not too bad. It's, it's nice out there. I went for a bike ride at lunch and it was, it was really nice, but it did look, when I, when I wrapped it up, I looked at the sky and it looked like it wanted to rain, but I don't know if that ever happened. Did it ever rain today? <laughs> I haven't seen any rain yet. I don't know if it's going to come, but um, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens, but yeah. Not bad out there. Well, thanks for joining me uh, remotely. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Bedouin Sound Clash. We're going to hear some uh, older tunes, some newer tunes, some inspiring tunes. Uh, Jay, you know, you're in BC now. I know that you grew up in Vancouver, but I saw you were born in Montreal. And this, yeah. tr this Toronto band, Bedouin Sound Clash, forms in Kingston. So, like, that's all over the place. Like, maybe, <laughs> yeah. can I get an origin story? How did Bedouin Sound Clash come to be? Sure. Uh, yeah, my, um, I was born in Montreal, moved to my parents, but I left when I was like six months old. So parents moved to Southwest to Vancouver. They're from Toronto. Um, and then, uh, fast forward, went to university in Kingston and we went to, we went to Queens and Eon and I met more or less, I think we met on our first day, but we started the band within like the first month of meeting each other and we were like we become friends we were trading records and uh the rest was history in terms of the geographical thing we then a lot of people from montreal thought we were from montreal well we were we had a we had we were on stomp records in the beginning a montreal great montreal label uh scott punk label uh, our management was in montreal and so we kind of had this like pull once we graduated do we go to Montreal or we moved to Toronto and we decided on Toronto because we just felt that was where, where our home was. And really it is for the band. We, we spent, I just lived in Toronto for 10, 15 years, like my, all my twenties more or less, unless we were touring, unless I was living out of a suitcase, we, I had apartments in Toronto. So I lived in Kensington market. I consider us, we are a Toronto band. Like there's no, now, and your parents, Jay, you Question, said your parents, that, your parents were from Toronto? Yeah, my dad, uh, my dad grew up on the mean streets of Bathurst and Wellington when it was uh, still the Russian, Polak, Ukrainian ghetto. It was all homes. It was like, he grew up, let me put that better. He was born in 38. So he remembers the tallest building in Toronto being, he would, he, he actually told me as a kid, he used to go to uh, 
the Royal York Hotel and stare at it and go, my right. God, I can't believe they built a building that big. Isn't that and wild? now it's like this little dwarf. Yeah. yeah. It's wild for us, you know, because I was born and raised in Toronto as well. And it, when you think that mm. that was the tallest building, because it's sort of a shrimp now. Like it's sort of like. <laughs> oh, yeah. It looks like, it looks, <laughs> it looks, looks like they got to do it's, something. They got it, taller yeah. buildings in Pickering, right, Eon? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. They're building them right now, to be honest. So, yeah. so Eon, okay. So we learned Jay, you know, got he's got that Montreal birth, but very young. He's in Vancouver. And then he goes to school in Kingston. He meets you and he ends up in Toronto. And then now he's out west again. But where are you from? You were at Queens, but are you from Kingston? No, I'm definitely not from Kingston, though it was a fun place to be for uh, for university, and it was a great place to meet Jay and get this band going. Um, I'm actually born in Toronto as well, um, born downtown. Uh, until I was about four years old, we lived uh, kind of in the Flemington Park area, so like Don, Don Mills, um, up that area. And then uh, after that time, uh, my parents were able to find um, better employment out in the burbs. So... They moved out to Pickering, and that's basically where I grew up. Um, I have a place in Toronto, and right now I'm actually in Pickering uh, doing this interview. So, yeah. Okay, so you're kind of back home, full circle, like you say there. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to play a jam that's not by Bedouin Sound Clash, but I think this might get us back to that time and maybe help us understand the name of the band and everything. So just let's give this a few moments here. Uh, Again, not a Bedouin Sound Clash jam, but it all makes sense in a moment. begging for me to talk over it anyways but <laughs> do you guys know what i'm playing here i'm feeling this is badawi yeah i'm presuming it's badawi yeah <laughs> yeah I, I know i know the town like i'm saying it's 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 honey child singing right yeah this is uh suspicions uh this is like yeah, a, yeah. so i'm gonna p- keep this in the background and maybe help us understand where does this uh name bedouin sound clash come from so uh, that record, okay, so this is a Badawi record called Bedouin Sound Clash. Um, who said, I'll just put this out there. The, the, rec, the cover of this record too, kind of always looks to me uh, like King Brit, who produced our record. He's from Philly, he's a house DJ, and he produced our record in like 2010. Anyways, that's just a side note. Just sort of splitting, splitting ahead in timelines and multiverses. Oh no, I love um, doing that. So yeah, go off yeah, and then so come back. Just don't forget to come back. That, this is this is something that I just have have pontificated about in my life in the last couple. But of years. Eon, do you agree um, with that analysis? <laughs> it looks like King Brit. Yeah, 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 yeah. it kind of looks like it might be some like, guy. Like it's the same. Yeah. King Brit, like '97 with the <laughs> pro and everything. So, um, Badawi. Okay, so this record, Badawi. Is is an uh, was an Israeli is an Israeli dub artist living in New York. Uh, put out a record called Bedouin Sound Clash. Now I I like heard about this record and on really like you know through blogs and this is in like ni- the like late nineties. So these blogs like it was like an ambient dub rec- dub blog that I used to check. Anyways, I ordered this record three times at my local record shop and I could not get it. I think they, they, there's this record store in Vancouver called Basics that used to exist in Gastown. So it became this kind of like mysterious record to me. And when I finally got my hands on it, uh, I was, I remember I ordered, I ordered the CD and I got the CD. Um, and I had that in uh, my final year of high school. And I just loved the name Better When Sound Clash. I thought it was such a, a really cool name. When fa- fast forward, when we first started playing uh, in university, um, we I just we had a hand like the, the, the instrumentation we were using was uh, was sort of similar, and um, and I said, oh, this sounds like Bedouin Sound Clash, and the name kind of stuck. We had a show, 
like that later that week, I think. I don't know. And we just said, well, let's just call it Beto and Sound Clash. Not thinking anything of it. We thought, okay, well, yeah, well, I mean, how many shows are we getting? Like, you know, it's just right. like, hey, we're, we're having fun. This isn't like a forever thing. Um, yeah. And then it was. <laughs> it stuck. <laughs> like, yeah, well, well, not the name. Like, then we did... I mean, not that I didn't think we were going to be come of uh, this was going to be our career path, but um, I didn't know really that we, you know, like I like, and I'm saying this because later on we we actually talked with Badawi, who was kind of like, hey man, like you guys, you know, I made this project called Beto and Sound Clash, and we're like, hey, well, look, we're huge fans of that project, um, and it was it was seriously out of like respect and homage to the project and we love that and we hope that we're directing attention towards the um towards your record as well which is a great record uh but i think he was kind of like why did you guys do that <laughs> okay well okay well right now as we speak the fact that you're called bedouin sound clash resulted in me playing that and raising awareness like that just happened man sure. so yeah 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 it there only took go. a few decades but here we go Win, win for and me. I always say, yeah, and I mean, like, there are a lot of bands, and that to me is always like, I was like, well, there's tons of bands that are named after songs, after albums, well, yeah. you know, so that's how we thought about it. But. Yeah, I feel Gobsmack, I think, is named after an Alice in Chains song. Like, there's all these bands that are kind of yeah. named after uh, songs. So, Ian, yeah. you, you, I'm just curious to bring us back to that time at Kingston in Kingston when you're at Queen's University. Like, this was at first, this was just shits and giggles. Like, what was Bedouin Sound Clash at first? I mean, I wouldn't say it wasn't necessarily that, but it was definitely like, I think um, a really, like to, to me, it was actually like uh, like a really unexpected, um, amazing uh, extracurricular activity that allowed me to spend time with like friends and had potential. So it was kind of like, you know, where, where a lot of other friends maybe were like, you know, it's not like we didn't party or didn't do other things, but it was like, right. Whereas some other friends, I think, were doing a lot of that. We also carved out time to kind of write and play. And it was enjoyable. It was like, you know, I think I think it brought, you know, the members of the band at that time together in a way. Um, we were all away from home. We're all, you know, in this new place. And um, the music was, was kind of, like, exciting, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, I'd say that. Do you want to name check the members of the band at this time? Uh, just I sure. know we're talking to two of you, yeah. but yeah, who else? Yeah, sure. So, so I mean, it, it really started with Jay and myself. You know, Jay uh, playing some guitar and then coming over to my room, which was literally across the hall when I was playing some bass, and then I was starting to jam. And you know, Jay kind of having some some ideas that we worked on, and then he was in fine arts with uh, another friend uh, that he had met earlier in that. that I guess. It, it, Oh, yeah. really <laughs> um, named Brett Dunlop who happened to um, during Frosh Week walk down the street and buy a djembe <laughs> and so after we kind of <laughs> developed a couple of ideas Jay was like hey like I think uh, maybe this guy might be able to sit in with us and so Brett came and sat in with us and then we recorded some of the stuff that we had done this is a couple of weeks later and we recorded on Jay's four track and uh, yeah. Brett kind of got to take that over to uh, to to his dorm which was across campus, and he happened to live next door to a guy named Pat Pangeli, who was a, you know, had drums and was a drummer. And he heard the tape and said, "Hey, this is pretty cool. Like, can I play with you guys?" And after I don't know a little bit of coaxing or a couple of weeks, we kind of like agreed to do it, and and that was the the original incarnation of the band, the four of us. Okay, so I have a note. I have a few notes I'll be sprinkling throughout this conversation. But Cambrio wanted to know: Is your former drummer a lawyer, and does he represent you? <laughs> Is he a lawyer? Yes, he is. <laughs> Does he represent? Who asked that question? His, he goes Who by the handle Cam Brio. That's awesome. Cam, Cam or Ham? Cam, Cam. as in Cameron. Okay. Oh, I know, I know a Ham. I know a Ham Brio. <laughs> oh, nice, nice, nice. But anyways, no. Uh, yeah, go, sir. Do you want to you want to field this one, Eon? Sure, sure. So yes, Patrick Pengeli is a lawyer at, at present day. Um, and does he represent us? No, he does not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he would. He might. I don't know. We've yeah. never been in that no, no, no. position, but you know. In fact, we, we find ourselves adversarial meeting each other in uh, courtrooms all across Canada. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Okay, so. 
I want to know here, I'm going to play a song in a moment, which everyone listening knows. Okay. Cause if you were, uh, had a pulse in this country, uh, back in summer, the summer of Oh five, you know, the song, but my question is, so you mentioned the four track recordings and stuff, but is sounding a mosaic. Is that the first time that you, you record in like an actual studio? No. Okay. Oh, I don't know. That that's kind of a debatable question. It wasn't the first time we recorded a record, but it was kind of the first real studio because the other studio was kind of like a basement. Oh yeah, area right. for okay. fire. So it was it wasn't really like a proper studio. But although I will say this, that you know the, the guy that we recorded with, his name was Jan Kearney, I think. He had yeah. done some work with what was it, Sixpence and the Richer or something. So he had oh. he did have one plaque on the wall. And Kiss me. Studio. Exactly, <laughs> but but he, he he basically had just like a small. Uh, it wasn't really like a mixing desk. It was more. Well, like don't a- judge it for being in a basement because DJ Ron Nelson had his basement studio in the Dream Warriors recorded. Ron Nelson's the man. Yeah, I love so- him. Man. Yeah, he's a great dude. Yeah, man. I love him too. And I'm in a basement studio right now, and we're making magic right now. So. You're right, man. I'm, I apologize. I should take that back. So <laughs> I guess no. I'll say no. <laughs> so I'm no. maybe I'll play the song and then we'll talk about it, okay? Because uh, we can't have Bedouin Sound Clash on Toronto Mike without talking about this jam. So buckle up. This is one of yours. Uh, let's listen. I'm on the rock. And as my steps echo, echo, louder than before Another day is done Say goodbye to the setting sun See what I found Turn back to the ground Just like before And hey, hey When the night feels my song. Okay, let's talk about this. Who who wrote this song? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I remember writing it um, in my third year of university. Actually, and I and I thought this was going to be the first, the last song. I thought, well, we're graduating soon. I remember walking down the street at night and thinking, this is going to be the last song, maybe the last song. We were going into the studio, and I usually before we were. We're going into another studio, uh, and we and uh, it was in Montreal. It was like you know, and Eon's right. It was the first kind of real like, okay, we got to prepare. And usually when that happens, like there's like I've heard this happens with a lot of other bands too that you kind of have a you go okay, I'm gonna throw a few hail marys because we're going. So it's like last minute. I'm like, well, maybe we, this is it, right? So I thought of this song as the final closer to the album because at that time we had a lot of like faster, like sort of police songs, like jungle drum and bass songs. And this one was more like, um, I was just, you know, it was like, I definitely was was inspired by a lot of like Lady Smith, Black Mombazo. I've always like, you know, I think it's from singing hymns when I was growing up, like as a kid at school, we sang hymns. I just love, I love hymns. Uh, and I always have, and I, I, I always try to, I always seem to go back to like those kinds of four part, three part harmonies. So with this one, I, we actually never played it live. It was like, and then, but I remember, it, we, so it was just sort of one, an album track. It slowly migrated from being what I thought was the final track on the album. <laughs> then the label said, no, let's put it first. Uh, it's the first track on the album. But it wasn't really, there wasn't really much, um, traction to it it came out no one really noticed it and it was actually a dj in 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 the uk mike davies who ran a, a this show called the lockup on radio one on the bbc and he started playing it 
and that is it first picked up in England and then the edge and and uh people in Canada started like picking up on it but it was yeah and that was maybe a year and a half after the record had come out and we didn't know how to play it really we we never really played it we were like like oh this song is really popular you know like we haven't figured out how to play it uh so that's quite the story because I wouldn't have guessed that because I, I will say at this time and I have my timelines right this is this was a hit like this was in the summer of oh five right yeah, yeah in Canada it was oh five it's okay. a strange timeline because it's oh five in Canada and then it and then it was like oh five a bit it was oh five in the UK too but then it recharted in oh six in the UK again like so it's hard for us like it seems right. like to me it was like oh is that the summer of oh five or oh six but, but Ed, Canada, Ed, Ed started playing the mess out of this in the summer of oh five am I right that's true okay yeah, you're right. so, I, so in this time so Ian, I'm dying to know what you thought when you first heard that, like if you had any idea what you were on to here. But I will just tell you my experience was I was listening in 05. I was still listening to a lot of terrestrial radio. That's how long ago we're going back, gentlemen. But I was listening. 102.1 was my station. So we're pre-indie. That was the only place in the market where I could hear, uh, you know, alt rock or new rock or whatever. And that was played all the time. And you couldn't help but sing along to that song. Like it really did feel like that song was everywhere. That's what we it heard, was. you know, it, was, it, was funny <laughs> us, cause like, it definitely was. And like, you know, but, but but what was interesting was when all that stuff started to, like the traction started to happen with The Edge in Toronto, yeah. um, like Dave Bookman, you know, rest in peace out. Um, he was, he was amazing at, you know, pushing it and playing it during his segment and getting feedback and keeping it going. And that helped it grow. But when it started to really like gain a ton of traction, we were actually away because we had, um, uh, through Stomp Records the year before, we got to play the Warp Tour and kind of earned the uh, earned a position to do the whole tour. So we were on the Warp Tour in the states. It was our first U.S. tour. Nobody knows who we are. We don't even know how to tour properly, really. <laughs> um, we're like, you know, playing to basically the bands on tour and then calling home and finding out that oh, like the songs people are requesting it. Oh, it's on the chart. Oh, the video is on the. Yeah. So by the time we got to the Barry Warp Tour date that summer. Yeah. Um, they put us on like a bigger stage and like our merch tent was swarmed and we were just like, wow, this is like, yeah, not, not, this has not been our experience playing <laughs> thus far. Let's just put it that way. So yeah. it just blew up. And, who, uh, who was on that I band's remember, Warp Tour? Who was on that tour? Um, Follow Boy, My Chemical Romance. Offspring. It was the year. Yeah. yeah. But it was uh, the year I'm that, it was cool. the year that, it was the year that Follow Boy was breaking and my chemical my chemical romance was breaking and uh yeah so i remember we we kind of um yeah i don't know if we could (laughs) (laughs) that's just that's just i'm not gonna i'm not gonna hate that chance i don't know if the chance like the transplants were breaking to the point of like the fallout boy level but no they had the i remember the the one song yeah this is more for we we, we existed in different scenes you on you on scene the transplant (laughs) can i ask you was it diamonds and guns was that the big song yeah Yeah. Yeah. it was it was actually next to your jam that was the other one exactly and then the foreshadowing because later on we'll come full circle to the transplants with the interrupters so i'm just dropping i'm just dropping little gems oh i love it man i didn't realize i thought you were saying that bread Sure. The method to the madness. Right. <laughs> I right. love it. Okay. Well, I got I got more questions. One is that okay? So when you're recording this, is it? So this is where you're uh, you meet up with uh, Daryl Jennifer, right? That was before. Like okay. that was like Daryl was w- recorded the first album, sounding most the first like their first real album, sounding mosaic, which has when the night feels my song on it. Right. So that so we we worked with Daryl in 2003. We recorded this album to Montreal in April of 2003. It's, yeah, it's, it's and, funny, that delay, right? That delay from recording to uh, ge- mm. geeks like me singing it in our cars and stuff. Like, that's quite a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But well, did Daryl, when Daryl heard that, question. when Daryl heard that jam, like, uh, like I mean, for those who don't know, he's a bad brains. Like, um, yeah. I just wondered, like, if you had any inkling of what might happen in 05. Daryl, I feel like Daryl, like, well, first of all, he, wanted to work with us which was like you know there was no reason like that you know he saw something in us that we you know uh, I mean we just I, I I now look back on like I'm, I'm gonna go kind of around this for a second he 
I now look back on things in kind of amazement because I see that they aren't just like when I was younger, I always thought things are just a given like, yeah, yeah, of course we're going to do a record with Daryl from Bad Brains. But now that I look, I'm like, it was it's pretty amazing. Like we had nothing when we were just a young kid, not really much to offer. And he was, he heard, uh, yeah, he heard the music and he's like, yeah, I want to work with these guys. And, and I think what attracted him most was that we, the way we were doing, he's a real like dub heavy, more like heavy, hardcore reggae, like, listener right like he likes like that i mean he i was talking on the phone the other day and he's like you know his wheelhouse is like two chords dubbed out like bill laswell like you know kind of more grindy kind of i think he was attracted to that i think we, he if i i i don't know what he thought of this but i remember like usually he'd always like he like liked the he kept calling what did he call he kept he, i feel like these songs he they're sort of like he'd be like yeah they're cool like he didn't but he was really more into like when we would get really rhythmic, like, and so these songs, I don't know. I mean, he'd kind of be like, yo, like <laughs> for this one, he'd always be like, you sound like he, he always said I sounded like Elvis for some reason. He's like, you know, you remind me of Elvis kid. And then he, and which I was like, I, I didn't think I sounded like Elvis. Elvis or Glenn, Glenn Fry. It, no, 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 not Glenn oh, Fry. He said it, was, it was, um, Don, uh, uh, yeah, the, this, the, the guy from the Eagles, Don Henley. Um, Don Henley. Don Henley. Yeah, Don Henley. That's I hear it, man. You sound like Don Henley, kid. Yeah, I hear no, the texture. Like the yeah. So, but what did I think, Daryl? I don't know. I mean, he, you know, like, I think he. Anyways, regardless, of that, I like that's him. You can hear him. Like, we did this. The one thing that we did do is like, we did this sort of like gang uh, crash and track where all of us sat in the in the stu- in the main room and and just played on like parts of the drum kit like on the and then you can hear daryl being like saying like oh like uh, you can hear him talking as this like before the bass comes in and stuff so wow. um there's a i do remember i vividly remember recording this song and i really remember it, it's one of those moments where you go wow this song has a life of its own when i could once i heard all the harmony parts there was something happening right and it happens when you have like a certain song that you, like it happens only with a certain a few songs I've ever been a part of where it you're like this thing's bigger than what we intended. Jay, true, so. but um, how close did you come for like people not picking up on that? Like, like it sounds like it. Yeah, like UK that DJ in the UK has to start spinning it and it kind of resuscitates yeah. it. Like, why didn't Edge jump on the, this right away? To, Go ahead. Oh yeah, um, because I think if you said what we are yeah. to anyone, and even now in right. Canada. I mean, right. think about it, like, you know, like the UK has its own tradition with, with right. like the specials and the clash and, you know, Canada, it, especially at that time too, yeah. Canada wasn't exactly known for anything beyond, like even within Canada, it was a very, it was very much a like uh, folk tradition was really strong. Right. The rock and indie stuff was really strong. Um but the, anything outside of that was a little was just like a little more. You know fringe, what? So I'm glad you brought this up because I was trying to think of a com, like a comparable. And the only the best I could do here's the best I can do. Ready? Big Sugar. Okay, because Big yeah, Sugar yeah. was a rock band, but there was that reggae influence, and it was yeah. It, you know yeah. That's well, cool. and, and 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 Gordy Johnson also was like he he was like he came through Kingston and saw us play. He we opened for them, and he he was like loved us, and he was like he was the first person. Other than Daryl, who made us believe that we could, nice. you know, that we actually were a band, a real band, you know, as opposed to yeah. guys in the basement. So, for sure. what were you going to say there, Ian? No, not nothing really. No, I was just okay. going to say, yeah, like exactly, like Big Sugar for sure. Uh, I think exemplifies kind of what we always feel Canadian music can be because, you know, as Jay said, it for a long time it was just like the folk and the indie thing, and you know, for us, we're like. I know there's, a, there's there's so many different cultural traditions here that anyone can access. Right. Um, putting them together makes sense. And that's what we've done. And that's kind of what Big Sugar does too. So yeah, um, totally. I like it when... Yes. Wait, I like it when you mash up different genres, but I know it's uh, tougher to market, I guess. Like, I know the, the marketing machine likes you to fit into a box, right? That's like, you know, you conform and be this. Don't be this, you know... Uh, a hodgepodge of different genres and influences, right? Like it, it, it can be tough to be that kind of uh, creative and un, unbound. Yeah. yeah, I would think. I would. Think, and, hey, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. No. I mean, that is true. I mean, we we did always have that issue. Um, 
And going, I and mean, you're talking about chance, like, you know, yeah. what, what have, what, what, like, these, like, you give me a bit more detail is that Mike Davies, this DJ, was from the California. And so he knew of, of our band just uh, through our label, I think in LA, Side One Dummy. He played the song once. I saw that we'd been played on this show. And that, sh- I think at the time, the lockup played between like maybe 9 30 and 10, like, and 12 30. AM. So I saw that we, I was, I I saw that we've been played. Um, I was in London and I called uh, and I said, Hey, I emailed him and I said, cause I was like young and that's like, I would just be like, Hey, I'm going to email him and I'm going to be like, Hey, I'm, I'm in London. I'll come and play on your show. And he said, yeah, come on down. So I did that. And I, um, I'd met one of the guys from the Mescaleros, Scott Shields, uh, in, at a show in Hamilton, who the Mescaleros who played with Joe Strummer. Of course who was my hero. And so I said, Oh, it's a punk show. I'm going to bring Scott Shields. And he came with me and we played. And because of that moment, I feel like, well, not because of that moment, maybe, but what ended up happening was they were looking for, they had a bigger meeting within the, within radio one. This is what I've been told. So a bigger meeting with, within radio one. And they're like, we need to find some different stuff to play on, on the, on Joe Wiley's show, which is like, you know, if you're played there, you're like being A-listed. So, and they put forward, they put forward our name and they said, sure, let's try it. And it really is that like, when you're talking about like chance, like, yeah, it was like chance, you know? Uh-huh. So, and how much of it, you know, I, I think I, I, I do believe in like accommodation of both. You're, you're prepared to meet with chance, you know? So, well, if the song sucked, chance wasn't going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, but, and, and, and you can write, and that's the other, the, the, the other side of that is you can have a wonderful, you could be right. You could have a full career of wonderful songs right. and, and not, and not see that. So yeah. happen. maybe like Nick, you could be like, you know. Oh yeah. I, I know you're thinking of uh, Drake, Nick Drake. Like when, when you're yeah, the, I, was say yeah, Nick Drake, I, I knew you were going to say that because Drake, Pink yeah. Moon doesn't become massive until he, after he dies. Until, like, Vol- and then until Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Which, yeah. Okay. On that yeah, note, so. this is what a brilliant segue, Jay. If you ever want to co-host Toronto Mike with me, let me know, because I got to ask you, because my, my, my opinion on this subject has evolved through the years, which oh, I will I share with you in a moment, but you know where I'm going with this is, which is that, yeah. At some point, your song becomes the Zeller song. Oh yeah, I know. And let me tell you something about this. This is this is really. I love that you. T- I I forgot about the Zeller thing. This I'll is never forget. Go ahead. So this is how. Like the edge. The edge is one thing. Yeah. But Zeller's is really the thing that sold it. Like because all of a sudden you had moms and minivans, and at our show, like and still to this day, like we have moms come up to us, be like, "My kid loves it," or or when I was. When I was pregnant, my baby kicked to When the Night Feels My Song. Right. That summer, that's all we heard. It was like a baby song, which when we were that age, we are like, that's weird. But now I'm like, as I have a son, so I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Now, and, and I want to hear, yeah, please continue. I'm sorry for interrupting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With Zellers, um, I remember it was a big thing because we were, you know, we didn't have any money. I was, and they, they offered like, a lot of what was a lot of money to us at the time. You can tell me like statute of limitations yeah. and all that. What are we talking here? Like, so it wasn't that it might not seem like that. Well, no, now too, like $30,000, which to see that's 22 kids. That's kids a lot of money for old. a band like you at that point in your careers, $30,000 totally. might as well be $3 million. <laughs> it was, it was enough to be like, we, we might be able to do this. And then my mom, who is like very, uh, you know, she grew up, she grew up in Toronto going to both Beatles shows, but then in the sixties, like, you know, became very much like, you know, a Dylan, like Neil Young fan. She thought she comes from the tradition of like that's selling out. You you don't put your songs in, in commercial. That's like Neil Young's out. fault. It's all his fault. Cause I was feeling the same way because this notes for you. And he would say, ain't singing for Pepsi, ain't singing for Coke, but that's easy, oh, yeah. easy yeah. for Neil Young to say he sold yeah, exactly. millions of albums, <laughs> right? That came to a successful career first. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and well, this is, and, and yeah. you know, and, and it's funny because actually, this on this point, like, yeah. so it was this. Our agent said to us at the time, he's like, you know, like the Vigatanias did the commercial before you, and we just played a show with them with Ben Harper. The Vigatanias are, are a great folk band from Vancouver, I think. I'm not sure. So, I, you know, a lot of people had put had put their songs in this, um, but nothing like what happened to us mm-hmm. happened to them. It was like our song and it was like, 
it was like catnip or something to the people who were their target demo because it just like blew up and you were hearing it in like Rona's and like whatever. So, um, but from my perspective, I was like, we need the money and also the exposure. We don't have like, we're, there's no like, there's, we don't have folk festivals that are help, you know, like Neil, every time Neil Young, there's no lane way for what we're doing. And, and I saw someone like Moby at that time, just perm- and he was making great music and all he did was put it in car commercials. And I mm-hmm. come, came from a place like I didn't see, I personally found this like indie attitude. Like if you make the music for the right reasons, it can't really be changed by the context that you put it in within reason, right? Like it depends on what kind of commercial, but I do. But then after that, there were a lot of writers who use that as a, as a, as a, uh, as a way to take a shot at us. And, uh, you know, luckily that they're luckily probably, well, first of all, there's no jobs in that anymore, but also, um, that attitude has completely changed. Like kids are for better or for worse, that it is nope. not a thing anymore to do. So, well, listen, at the time I have to admit, like, I felt like, oh man, like this is the <laughs> Zeller song now. Like what a s- bunch of sellouts. Right. But as I matured and I learned more and I had conversations like this and you learn basically like, like whatever you have to do to make enough money to keep creating art. Like it's, you know, at some point this, the, the yeah. system is rigged against you guys. So if you can get 30,000 from a department store, uh, then good, good, good. Do it now. Now, in hindsight, the amount of uh, airplay and uh, awareness that that song gave Zellers, you got fucked, right? Like 30,000 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> we get fucked. Yeah, I know. Look at how good Zellers is doing now. You know, oh, well, we the, know ba- the bay, about- <laughs> you know, we actually put them out of business. That's right. <laughs> Zed's dead, baby. Oh man! Yeah, awesome. you put them out of business. <laughs> and also, I, like, you, you, all, go ahead. No, I was just remembering. It's funny. <laughs> you're, I'm remembering like when you're young, you never let like like you know like some writer at like Now Magazine or something like that that would that was like taking shots about Zellers. Watch out! Here comes this. I think, yeah, like the Zellers band. Um, and now it's funny because like I actually would. Feel feel good about having to explain what Zellers was to certain people because uh, no one, no one knows, no one right. knows what it was. Yeah, my anyway. what happened to my Club Z points? I was doing pretty well there, but I don't know if they're useless now or not. But uh, yeah, pe- us of a certain age remember fondly Zellers, of course. But yeah, you you, you guys killed Zellers. But uh, <laughs> okay, so here's a fact. I'm gonna just drop it before we move on. I could do. I realize I could do an hour on that one song, but uh, this is from Wikipedia. So you guys can tell me if this is true or not. According to Wikipedia. When the night feels my song is was the second the second most played track on Canadian radio. They said of of twenty two thousand and five. Does that sound right to you? Like number yeah. two. We're told that. Yeah. yeah okay. We I could tell you the songs. It's either the the song that either beat, beat us was either photograph. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. uh, Green Day's. Um, it, I'm okay. not American idiot. But w- wake me up when September ends. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay, and it was also the theme for CBC Kids, also of course. Uh, you know, I had like five years. Yeah, I had kids back then, so I still have kids. I guess it's weird how you were that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was a father in two thousand and six, uh, and and then I didn't I didn't know about this, but during and I was looking into it, and apparently T Mobile in the UK was using it uh, also yeah. in oh six. So. Okay, did well, you guys? That, yeah, yeah that's good. Did do you remember? Here's a quick uh, another Cambrio question, actually. But do you remember playing the Masonic Lodge in Mississauga? He says uh, he saw you at the Masonic Lodge. You remember this at all? Yeah. He wants to know what are your favorite small venues to play. Wait. So did oh, we? So the answer, first of all, yes, I do remember the Masonic Lodge in Mississauga. Where is it? I know Mississauga uh, pretty well. Where's like the, the streets for like the streets for oh, Okay. Yeah, I feel yeah. All right, exactly. shout out to like, Billy like, Talent then. Like, yeah, Billy like yeah, I think I think that I'm assuming is that where he's talking about? I can remember that show. I think it was like, like full blast. And, um, okay. Yeah, it was like I'm I'm picturing like somehow Monine was involved. Yeah, Monine it. and full blast and yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking is if, if that's what he's thinking. Okay. Um, but no, we we played there again. Our own, like a Dine Alone. Sounds like a real, sounds like a real jewel carrier thing. Okay, so, uh, um, 
small venues. What's our favorite small venue to play? <laughs> Don't all small? answer at once. Don't answer all at once. Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a small venue. Um, He's got um, the tough questions. That is actually a tough question for some reason. Yeah, I'm trying to think now. Mm. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Okay, so my, I, like, we used to play, uh, like, in terms of, like, memorable small shows, we used to play the Queen's Pub. That was, like, their, we, we got an, a monthly gig at the Queen's Pub, which is probably, like, like, they really were supposed to fit 60 people in it. But by the time we finished out, it would have like 300, 400, you know, like there'd be a lineup. Um, and we'd do like three sets. I remember that that was so exciting to play that place. Uh, and we just thought, we can't believe it. Like we can, like, did, you know, how many people are showing up. And it was that, that, that was, I mean, everything about it was terrible. We were like <laughs> kitty corner to a bar that was like 10 feet from the stage. And there was like the sound system. I mean, there was no sound system. I mean, it was everything. <laughs> everything about it was terrible um, from from perspective of like later on. Yeah. But they were the most I've you know like exciting shows. Right. Yeah. No, um, no. Just because of how it made me. Yeah. Like how I felt about you know for me. So yeah, those those. I guess that could be my answer for for uh, Hambrio. Cambrio, what, what, what Cambrio. Was, was spot? Was spot? I can't remember the name now, but what was the spot? That we used to play. Uh, was it four seven seven or three seven? What, what was the spot with uh, where we played? Oh yeah, the snackers and stuff like that. The gay, the gay club. Yeah, on Princess Street. There was another small. I think it was four seven seven. Street. Okay. It was yeah. a number, and it was like we did a couple of shows, not too many, but those shows were also like really, like tight, small, fun, and like I remember kind of like. Yeah, the Slackers playing with the Slackers, who's a band that we love. Uh, getting their kind of, you know, um, co-sign during that time was kind of fun too, and like, you know, and then mm-hmm. a vote of confidence for us too. So amazing. I mean, and let's talk briefly here about bigger shows. Uh, you guys toured with No Doubt. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. Any stories from that? Like, how was that? It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eon says it was know. great. We'll move on then. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it was great. Okay, uh, that was a great. I, I mean, that was a dream for us. Like you know, those guys. Um, in terms of like bridging between uh, a lot of our interests, like eighties music, dancehall, reggae, ska, punk, and then doing what they've done, what they did with their career, and that was amazing. And being around, seeing Gwen Stefani perform every night was 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 really pretty. Act- pretty amazing actually like she is a fantastic performer what like she is she on stage her like she she brings like warmth to it to a stadium size venue and that's a real skill so i i would watch her because i you know yeah i admired that a lot it was it was cool to see to see them play so before we get you to street gospels and don't worry we won't spend this much time on everything here just a little heavy and then we get to Six six hours oh, later, yeah. you guys are like, "Are we done oh yet?" Oh my god, are we? We only have ten minutes left. Well, <laughs> it, it really depends on you. Like, do you have? Do you have a? Yeah, you have to go in ten. No, minutes? I'm just shocked that I've been talking for fifty. <laughs> we've been talking for fifty minutes. <laughs> well, that's how it works here. Everybody, you know, oh, you just spent ninety minutes. It's like I thought that was like fifteen minutes. Uh, that's how it works. That's how you have a good combo. But okay, you're an artist. <laughs> it's only episode one thousand and what is this one thousand and eighty two? <laughs> so I've, I've done it a few times. But I want to talk street yeah. gospels. I'll just let you know. Originally, I was going to play some of. Uh, I wanted to play a song I always loved from you guys. Uh, walls fall down, and then I'm not sure. You know, do you want me to play a bit of that, or do you want me to just tell you I love it? Tell us you love it. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Great jam. People go find it. Walls fall down. But let's talk about the follow up. So you have, you know, the success uh, with that, you know, all that airplay and all the attention and all those uh, Zed Zellers dollars. What do you call that again? Uh, Zed bucks or whatever they called. I feel like Club Z Club Z, club Z points. Whatever. Club Z points. That's yeah. what it was. Look at the club. Z. It was a club, yeah, yeah exclusive. Uh, they didn't just let anybody in that club. So. No, 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 no. <laughs> members only. Right, members only for sure. I still remember that big teddy bears. Uh, Zeddy, I think his name was. But again, <laughs> Zed's, bet. Zed's dead, baby. Okay, Street Gospels. 
I'm going to play a bit of a song that was a big radio hit for you guys off Street Gospels, and then I have a few questions about this one, but let's listen. Okay, so I'm not playing Walls Fall Down. I'm going to play instead St. Andrews. Speak the truth and speak ever, cause it what it will. Cause he who hide the wrong he did, did the wrong thing still. So, gentlemen, when you're in the studio to record the follow-up, uh, I'm always curious, is there pressure? Like, we need hits? Like, how does it work when you're in that studio? Well, unfor- like, uh, fortunately for us, we, like, because there was this huge delay in When the Night Feels My Song, we actually had gone into the studio before that broke, right. recorded the, all of this music. Actually, except for the... the what was, St. Andrews, we recorded... Uh, in Woodstock with with Daryl, but yeah, we, we, had, we had all these, yeah, like we had all these songs ready to go, and then we were holding this record uh, for like a year and a half while we toured. So we kind of had it in the bag. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Yeah, and this was uh, but, uh, at least on Edge One Hundred Two Point One. This went to to number one on the on that station for sure. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I don't even know. You yeah. know, Eon. I don't know. Yeah, that's awesome. But I didn't know that. I I think it did. Yeah. Yeah, and this comes out. Oh, I guess. Sure. Oh, sorry, yeah, I did. No, you're gonna take my word for it. Um, yeah. cit- citation needed, as Wikipedia would tell you. Citation needed. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> so this this record comes out. Street Gospels comes out in uh, summer of '07. I guess late August, August 21st, uh, 2007. I would be remiss if I didn't tell everybody that you guys did win the Juno Award for uh, New Group of the Year, which I believe is a kiss of death. And my my condolences. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, well deserved. And that uh, when the night feels my song was also nominated for song of the year. I guess you didn't win because it says nominated. Do you remember what beat you? Michael like Bublé. Why Michael Bublé? Michael Bublé. Yeah. Oh fuck oh. that guy! Come on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. And no one's ever fucking heard of him again. <laughs> what a joke! Yeah, yeah, you know, hey, he sold out yeah. too. He sold out too, right? You know, the bubbly. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. The bubbly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where was the hate for him on that? <laughs> <laughs> you were ahead of the curve. Again, my even me, like my even me, believe it or not, the great Toronto Mike. Uh my uh my my thought on it initially was a bit like what I was brainwashed by Neil Young to think that no artist could have their song tied to a corporation or a brand. I'm like, no way. But again, Neil Young had sold millions of albums, okay? So he had this, yeah. you know, where a band like you, I say you know, get what you can get for your art, man. I was told I completely evolved my thinking on uh, you guys with Zellers, but we, we're going backwards now. Okay, so St. Andrews. No, I. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to rip on on <laughs> baby boomers for a second. But do that's it, fine. do I'll it. Focus. They deserve it. <laughs> they deserve it. I, I actually don't. You know what? I don't. I I actually I don't like the whole boomer thing. I but I I do think that it. We, we it's the privilege from which you can say certain things that sometimes goes unnoticed right so like yeah it must have been great when the record industry was doing super well right. and there's tons of money yeah. yeah the man who's you know pr- uh, the bulk of his career was pre-internet i don't think uh, i think he's got to sit this out i think it's a whole different area well, did he what, they, okay just going on it's like what my favorite thing was him uh what was it if they if they played joe rogan on spotify nearly i was like right. i'm out and everyone's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, okay. He pieced but, out on that sure. one. 
The strange thing was, I yeah. would get I would get the odd note like, "Are you going to follow Neil Young and like pull your podcast from Spotify?" I had the odd note right. at the time, and I was thinking like, "Leave me out of this." Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess you have to be careful. Do you have to? Yeah, like that's the. Crazy I mean, you part, can you right? can Everyone listen to me like, on Spotify. Uh, I don't, you know, Spotify doesn't give me any money, but apparently they don't give artists like you any money either. I've had. I mean, I can't no. tell you. Why don't you? Who do I have on the star stars? Okay, so I had on Torquil Campbell from Stars, yeah. and and he went off on the whole streaming system. But it, like, do you see any money? <clears throat> Yeah, you do see money. Yeah. It's just that maybe it, it it could be done differently. Like, I mean, for example, you know, one thing I thought an idea that I thought might be it was a good idea was that instead of you, you know, spending ten ninety ten bucks a month, and you know, a lot of your money is going towards say the, the uh, like some of the biggest selling artists, but you only listen to stars, right? Then maybe there's a way that your money actually goes to subsidize the amount of stars albums you're listening to, as opposed to uh, Taylor Swift's album. You know, because on on aggregate, like you know, I think that's I don't, and I'm not, I'm no expert on, on this. So, um, but you know, it's new technology, and that's kind of what happens in music. So. And this is yeah. all uh, a reaction to the fact that we were just stealing it from Napster. Like we were literally just. I mean. You know, it yeah. was, so it's like, okay, these idiots like Mike are just going to steal this, the radio singles. They're not going to cough up the uh, 15 bucks for the CD. They're going to steal the radio singles they want to hear. So we need to compete with that. And I guess, you know, then you have iTunes 99 cent, a song, which to me sounds better than the current state, which is every song in the history of the <laughs> world for $10 a month. <laughs> <laughs> and Beto and SoundClash yeah. can share that with the Beatles and Drake and uh... right, right, right. exactly. But you know what's crazy? And so there's the incentive, right? First of all, it's that you know the mu- music industry is based on technology, and they didn't keep up with technology. And then for like a brief period, they were fucked. Yeah. Right. Like real labels were fucked. Right. And then and then they realized like now they're making as much, if not more, money because on aggregate they've got this huge back catalog. So there's no incentive to like you know beyond like say like get hey this kid has tons of followers or is like getting tons of traction on like on like one song so let's get that part of our catalog but there's no incentive to like build right and if we go to someone like neil young there's no like it's it's we're not in an era where there's like a david geffen who's like hey i'm gonna build you over uh a stable of artists from Joni mitchell to neil young to whoever over a period of many of a decades decades right so yeah, uh, it's not about development but, at all anymore. It's about like just like no. proving that like the, the talents proving themselves and getting their own fan bases, and then people are you know the industry's coming in after the fact as opposed to developing things like they used to at a, at a certain time. So you know it's it's pretty reactive right now to be honest. And even now, it's, except for that you know point zero one percent, it sounds like you can't quit your day job anymore. Like uh, you know, I mean, there was a time when you could be like my you know I'm thinking. I'm going way back now, like Kim Mitchell, okay, with Max Webster, right? Like he told me this story on Toronto Mike where they all lived in a house and they paid a hundred bucks a month each for the rent and they were like starving artists and they were figuring it out. And then that was, but that was their job. Their job was to be rock stars even before they had, you know, the, 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 the sales to back it up or whatever. But you, I don't know. I don't know unless your parents are rich and you're some kind of trust fund kid. I don't know how you do it in 2022. Well, I think that's across the board, though, yeah. right? Like, I mean, yeah. that's that's sort of the growing divide that happens not just within. Hey, what happens within journalism? It's happening within a lot of a lot of careers. Is is like wages aren't going up and the cost of living, especially now, like is is crazy. So I don't know. We you know it's hard. It's hard to. It's hard. It's extremely difficult to change the course of something. Like if you tell someone. Hey, you're gonna have this relationship with a song for the for all of your life, right? So, could you would you consider paying? What would you consider paying for that? Nothing, but you're willing to pay like you know, ten dollars for an avocado toast. That makes sense. To me. Like it's right. really hard to not to to change it to to change consumption. 
guess. No, 100%. Yeah. And you mean you know, newspapers, and we, we won't go too long on this, or this really will be a lot longer than I promised. Uh, yeah. But, but you know, newspapers are trying to figure out, like, for, we, were, we got used to getting our news for free, and now it's like, how do you put that genie back in the bottle? And, like, you know, the, this is an expensive to, to, to pay journal, good journalists and investigative uh, reporters and stuff. And here you are expecting all this content yeah. uh, for zero dollars and zero cents. Like, like, how do you, yeah. It's yeah. Well, and now and now that's why it's so untrustworthy because it's like beholden to the advertisers, whereas before the advertisers didn't wouldn't have as much of an impact on like your story writing as much. Like now, it's like such a, an immediate right. response, and right. so you, the writers themselves are like thinking of probably but like it, they're beholden to clicks and like it's oh yeah. dude. I think about the whole time. Let's say Honda is your big advertiser. Oh my God, we got a big advertiser. It's Honda. And I don't know, there's some investigation into some faulty brakes or something with Honda. I always wonder like the sales guy calling the reporter and going, hey, like that's like 80% of our revenue this month. Maybe we don't, yeah. maybe we don't run that story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also you like on the current business model of outrage, like you're going to, you're like, we need more stories that are, are catering to the most charged up people who are going to click on that story. And then therefore your advertisers are going to be most beholden to those, to that subset of people. And you've right. got like, right. you've got just this amazing uh, storms and teapots all over the world, you know? So, yeah. So you two, and again, anyway, there's my, there's no man. Reason. Awesome. We're, and again, we're going back, but we're coming forward. So 2022, as we speak, I'm going to play a new, I'm going to play a new Bedouin sound clash song. It's amazing that we're, we, you know, Bedouin sound clash still creating great music, but like I'm straight up. Are you able to live off Bedouin sound clash or do you have, um, like, is it a gig economy and you've got multiple, uh, balls in the air? Like Eon, let's start with you. Like, 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 is it, is it, does he, does Bedouin sound clash become a side hustle? Cause Zellers went out of business. What happens? <laughs> so, <laughs> Zellers, Zellers thing was really crushing to our career development. I can't, lie. <laughs> no, um, uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, the band, we're, we're fortunate to be in a position where, you know, I think with the rights maneuvering and the rights planning, we're, we're able to sustain, you know, a lifestyle that, you know, it's, it's fine for both of us. Um, you know, uh, depending, I know that not every musician is in that position and, you know, we, we, we've been pretty blessed to, to have some success that, you know, continues to kind of pay it forward and those songs that are still on the radio and people are still, still interested. Um, but like, I mean, I think these days, you know, depending on what your goals are, if you, if you want like, you know, big things or to do a lot of things, you might have to like start looking at other things as well. Um, I've always been somebody that's been interested in a bunch of different things. So it's not necessarily because of the position the band's in, but like I, you know, I've, I've DJed for a number of years and done a couple of other things on the side as well. So sure. um, that's just out of personal interest as well. But um, I think the band's always been in a position like we've, we've done a pretty good job of maintaining our, our position in, in the industry to, to, to maintain a lifestyle that that's okay, you know? But Eon with a J and he's not, pretend he's not here. Uh, he moved away. Like he, what, you were in Toronto based band and now Jay's in uh, <laughs> BC. Like does right. that, does that put a, a wrinkle or do you just use this wonderful thing we call the internet to work around that? Well, that, I mean, that was, I mean, that's kind of a testament to, you know, the, the you know, the, the support the band's had and the success that we've had that we be in a position where we can work this way, you know, where it's a little bit different. Um, yeah, for a long time, it was a lot easier to be in the same place, but there was also a lot of personal things for us. I think, um, you know, Jay's from the West Coast, I think, uh, you know, there was a thing that whenever, whenever you come back from, from school, I'd always be like, oh, like, he always seemed like really refreshed, had like a whole new perspective, new songs, new ideas. Um, and um, Toronto does not necessarily always spark those kinds of things. So I'd always be like, oh, man, like, you know, if you could spend more time out there, shit. And I think, you know, once we had that opportunity, you know, he's kind of ran with it. And um, the music's gotten a lot better as a result. And um, working, yeah, we kind of start in a, in a demo stage that's kind of internet-based. You know, Jay will send stuff, we'll send it back, we'll try and go back and forth. And then um, we usually spend some time together one way or another. So with Mass, you know, it kind of started internet-based. And then we spent a month in, um, in L.A. Uh, together just, like, nice. working the songs out. And then with uh, this last one, I went to Victoria last year and we spent a bunch of time working the songs out. And so um, that's kind of been the process now that we're on opposite ends of the country, so to speak. Any uh, 
any idea like like I'm wondering Eon if you're considering at all moving to the 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 left coast there where the uh, you got the ocean and the mountains is it calling your name have you considered moving out there I have yeah no I, I spent you know like six months out there last summer and hey. you know, it's kind of it was kind of an open-ended thing and um, I really enjoyed my time and sure. obviously Jay being there and, you know, some great people that I know there and, um, makes it enticing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not, I definitely haven't ruled it out. It's definitely a, you know, a possibility, um, for how long, I don't know, but I think it's something that would be fun to kind of explore down the line, uh, when it makes sense, you know? So. I think, I think we owe British Columbia some artists because, uh, Biff Naked moved to Toronto. I don't, this is big news, <laughs> right? Cause she was... <laughs> She's Bit living naked. Yeah, yeah. She, she's living in Mimico now. Okay, she's, she's become a dear friend, but she was thirty-five years in Vancouver. She was an old school Vancouver punk That's rocker, right? Sure. Right, yeah, and awesome. she's yeah. she's ours now. So I feel like in that trade, we have to send yeah. something over. So Eon, Eon from the uh, you know, like it. Thank you. <laughs> Seems like a strange trade to me, but I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Biff Naked lives in Toronto. That's a you know what very yeah. odd move, very very different move. I'll say odd move, different move because usually you're like West Coast when they just are like, yeah, I just want like a lower slower pace or something like that. <laughs> well, I asked her. I said, which, which, usually, yeah, I said, what, what, like, how did how did this come to be that you you know I I consider her like she calls me her neighbor like she's kind of in my my hood here, and she said all her musician friends had moved to Toronto, so she was like following them or something, but. Really? Yeah. This, when this oh. is like pre-pandemic, right? So sh- I'm thinking eight, 2018, maybe 2017. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can and I, before I play Shine, and and I'm gonna have to uh, upset Neil Young myself actually by uh, I'm gonna have to thank some sponsors. So I'm gonna have to sell out myself. I, Zellers is not a sponsor, unfortunately, but I'm gonna share a quick uh, Bedouin Sound Clash memory that I have, which is, and I know it was 08 for a reason. I'll explain in a minute. But I used to go to all the Casby Awards. Because yeah. I'd get tickets. To, I remember I had a great hookup at CFY where I get tickets to Casby Awards and Edge Fests. But the 2008 Casby Awards, I remember attending, and I distinctly remember you guys performing there. So, do you guys remember playing Casby's? Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what here? So okay. So any uh, yeah. any any because you laugh when you say that. But any any uh, anything interesting there, or should I? Well, it was like I mean that was like the the height of like rock jo- shock jock what did you guys call- what is it called yeah i call Dean it like Lundell? what's Dean- uh, like, yeah, i Dean think Lundell. of it no i have right? a term for this bro bro music like it's for bros it was for bros but it was it was like it wasn't even the music part of it right like it was dean blundell and like his friends and then it's like people who love his comedy and part of i mean part of that was like you're going up on stage I remember it was just like that. We went up, you'd go up on stage and it would be like, it would just be chaos of like, like I think Tom Green had come up before us. He yeah. had thrown a th- tons of loaves of bread around. And so oh, the whole set were just getting like, like bread thrown at us. Like it was just, that's, that's the Casby. That was what the Casby's were. Yeah. It's know, funny like you mentioned the whole bro happen? thing, right? Because um, I did this special episode 1021, which was like a really deep dive into the history of CFNY. And I had all these interesting people on the Zoom, like uh, people you would know might be like, like Alan Cross is on the Zoom, right? And Alan is yeah. telling the story about Dean Blundell because Alan was the program director at CFNY for a period. And Dean Blundell would go into his office and demand that he fire Dave Bookman because Bookie wasn't bro enough. Like, you know, Bookie was passionate, knew his music. <laughs> And what ended up happening is they ended up actually in 09, they ended up uh, moving Bookie to like late nights or they took him off the afternoon drive and brought in Fearless Fred from right. Edmonton because Fearless Fred and Dean were like the more matched because they were both attracting those bros that were so uh, important yeah. to these guys. Right. Is that right? Okay, so yeah. Well, okay, so the Caspies was like their night out. So that's <sighs> what it, it was just, a, it was just a simple, like, that's what I remember, Cassie. But it would always be funny because you kind of see, like, I mean, uh, we obviously a band like ours wasn't necessarily the meat of that right. kind of show, right? Like, it's like they're looking, their red meat was like, I don't know, like a rock, Billy yeah. Talent. I don't know, like, yeah, yeah, Billy yeah. Talent. Sure, so sure. I even think Billy Talent might be a little too, I'm thinking maybe more like Finger Dead Man, Finger, Finger 11. 11. Yeah. Like Alexis on Fire? What? No. 
Sure. Yeah, but weren't they yeah. a little too art? I feel like Alexis would be a little too uh, punk. Like pretty Casby. I don't know. They were pretty Casby. Or were they pretty Casby? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I remember that night, and it- I remember seeing like I remember seeing like you see like people like they kind of always had that same look in their face, like yep, yeah. uh, like I, I think like uh, we did one year we did it was like metric and I don't know there just always be like this mix of Sam Roberts I feel like Sam Roberts was always there. Did we do that with Beatrice. Sam Roberts is a, was a good Casby guy. What? Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, for sure. Did, did we do it with Beatrice once? I feel like beer just was there one time. Did we? Did we oh my god! That? Yeah, we did do it. I think we did day. the last well, time we were there. One moment I remember from the 2008 Casby's, and I can time this for sad reasons, which is I remember like a final award. I think I ended up going to Ubiquitous Synergy Seeker or something. But but yeah, I remember yes. oh. George Strombolopoulos, yeah. who I just saw a uh, human kebab from USS. I just saw him. Oh. I went to a Moist and Tea Party show at History, uh, and uh, the DJ oh. between the sets was a uh, human kebab. But okay, I digress. So St- Strombo is on the stage with uh, Martin Streak and they're together and because Strombo had left the station so like I, it was like a special appearance from Strombo but Strombo and Martin Streak giving out this award to USS and I the reason I know this was 08 is because uh, you know by the no- 2009 Casby's Martin Streak had taken Martin his Cass. life um, so it's sort of yeah. tattooed on my cranium there okay gentlemen I'm going to play some shine and find out what's going on right now uh, but I need to thank some sponsors, okay? So I'm not going to thank Zellers. Fuck them. They're gone. I'm going to thank... Well, no, I want to say thank you, thank Zellers. Them. Can I just say, Help can us. I do my own <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry, you don't get to just say that to us. Thank you so much, Zellers. Yeah. Uh, rest, R.I.P. No, I, I kid. I'm just jealous. That's amazing. Uh, although you had to split it. No, you can it. say fuck them. Okay, I can say it. Will. Yeah, you yeah. will never say it. No, but you did have to... How many members of the band had to share the 40,000, uh, the 30,000 bucks? Is that four? Uh, three, that was a three at the time. I love that you like. This is the most like specific money interview I've ever done. I, I know it's not about the money, here. but on that note, uh, no, you're like, so when, how did you guys? And after taxes, like, what would that be like? Yeah, just know? was that hold, a good year for you guys? Hold your T four up to the camera. I just want to see what's on. <laughs> I'll give you my social insurance number. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, please. M- money doesn't money doesn't matter. I do want to thank though, uh, Palma Pasta. Authentic Italian food. They're in Mississauga and Oakville. Go to palmapasta.com. And Great Lakes Brewery, which is actually brewed in Southern Etobicoke, but you can find them in LCBOs across this fine uh, province. So, Eon, you're going to be able to score some, and you will not be able to score any J until you come visit us here. I know, GLB, they're good. Yeah, they're great. And when I do meet you finally in person, Eon, uh, I will get you some uh, fresh craft beer from Great Lakes. StickerU.com, they're they're in Victoria. They're everywhere you get an internet connection and you can uh, go to StickerU.com and get your uh, Bedouin Sound Clash stickers and decals and uh, temporary tattoos and all that jazz. Ridley Funeral Home have been pillars of this community since 1921 and I want to thank them for their support and oh so jay's gone we're gonna see if he comes back but i'll just wrap this up and then we'll see if we can reconnect for the home stretch here what was it something maybe it's because i uh, offended uh him when i went off on zellers with the f u zeller when he said funeral home he went ghost which is really suspicious so i don't know maybe there's some spiritual going on with him right now i don't know well i will say uh Speaking of Vancouver, that's where Dewar's from, but they have a new location on Queen Street here in Toronto. And if you go to Dewar.ca, you can see their uh, pants and shorts and shirts, the world's most comfortable pants and shorts. Save 15% right now with the promo code Toronto Mike. And Eon, uh, do you enjoy cannabis? <laughs> have I enjoyed this? I have. Yes, I have in the past. Everyone it sweats is- of that question. They forget it's yes. legal now. They're like, oh, yeah, it's legal no, now. I know, it's true. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> well, uh, you know who won't be sold, won't be undersold on cannabis or cannabis accessories is Canna Cabana. They got 100 locations across the country. Go to cannacabana.com, sign up for their uh, Cabana Club, and be in the know when they got a sale going on, which is all the time. So thank you, Canna Cabana. So, Eon, um, Jay's not, he's not upset. I'm worried I said something. I was just goofing around there. He's not upset, right? Nah, no, I know, I know. I, you I, know I him mean, better than I do. I didn't he, piss, I didn't. I, he, was, he can be real sensitive. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm, I'm sure I was worried because I, what, am I asking too many money questions? Because I did ask a lot about the, the, the Zellers uh, <laughs> deal, but. 
Yeah, real, real, real sore spot, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> well, here, let me start your new jam, and then uh, we'll we'll talk about it, and then hopefully Jake comes back for the uh, the home stretch here. But uh, maybe yeah. maybe he lost power or something. So I feel like that's what happened. I'm sure he'll be back. Okay, good. I'm I'm sweating over here. I don't want to upset Jay no, from no, a better no, one. No. You didn't class. do anything okay. wrong. Okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's some shine, and we'll talk about it. it shine on and good news fotms jay is not mad at me he uh, is back welcome back jay <laughs> i feel is, is eon gone now no eon are you gone hold on let me i flipped over. oh he's right there yeah uh, he's still there oh, okay i couldn't see him <laughs> but jay i was worried because i could tell maybe you thought i was asking too many personal questions about finances and stuff and then i said fuck you to zellers and <laughs> right. then you just you yeah. left and i'm like i hope i didn't piss off jay well, I actually, I think what happened was I said, I'm not going to even say it again, because I think I said something about my, my sin number, and then all of a sudden it ah. just went dead. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're like, back. It was <laughs> like the government was like, get her, you know, stop. Yeah. I'm watching. I'm glad you're back. So we're, we're listening to Sh- Shine On. Tell me, first of all, sounds amazing, so congrats. And this is fresh stuff. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you can about uh, this song and how we can get it. Um. Uh, I get it. You can get it on any streaming platform that you so desire. Um, would you like that, or would they, you rather they like they maybe they can buy a I don't know. Do you have, can you buy it directly from the band maybe and put more more money in your pocket? You can do. Uh, yeah, we should talk to someone about that. You can send us money because I know I know some some bands I know I they're like oh we have like vinyl and if you buy it I don't know you twenty bucks for the vinyl we'll. You know, it's then I don't know right. what percentage is going to them versus uh, go stream it, and then you know, you know what happens then. Well, we we um, will. I th- this is just going to be this is just a digital single, so but um, yeah. Who's on it? Like I Shine think, On has a great uh, voice on it. Who who's guesting yeah, on so this? Yeah, so that's Marcia Marcia Richards from the Skins, uh, which is a great like UK reggae band, reggae punk. I don't know what they are. Like they're like very UK. Yeah, uh, we did it. We toured with them uh, recently in the UK. Well, recently before the pandemic, and uh, so that's Marcia singing. She's she's awesome. Is there more material uh, coming? Yes. Yeah. We'll have a new <laughs> single out next week. Actually. Yeah, we'll have a new single out soon. Yeah. Oh, you don't want an exclusive uh, debut here on Toronto Mike? You don't want to. Uh... Well, that's the Christina Hernandez question. Oh, okay. Because we're not. She likes we're me. Not, <laughs> does yeah, she? That's good. She likes we're not, me. We don't know what to do. How? What? What happens beyond we just make music? What, <laughs> yeah. what about seeing you live? Like, uh, are we going to be able to see Pedro and Sam Clash live? Yeah, we're doing a show at the Paradise Theater, which is I, I like. We're doing a little kind of like small, intimate show uh, next week. Yeah, next Tuesday on the 19th. Yeah, on the 19th, we're at the Paradise oh, on Bloor. I know it well. Uh, I had my bike light stolen from outside of that place. I know it very well. Absolutely. It's great theater. They did a great job uh, fixing it up. Oh, I heard. Yeah, I heard that they did a good job inside. It's good that it was only your bike light and not your actual bike. Oh, I know. I know. But <laughs> dink move, right? Because like, it's, now it's nighttime. I got a bike home and it's like the lights are gone. I was like, this. I mean, right. thank you for leaving my bike, yeah. but you, you could have left the lights too. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Jay, you're making a trip back, uh, back home then. I'm coming back. You're coming back. back. Okay. Yeah. Guys, cool. honestly, uh, 
I know I promised an hour in, in typical Toronto Mike fashion. I stole 15 minutes more because uh, that's that's what I do. But I, I love your music. I love your sound. And now I can say after spending, you know, almost an hour and a half with you that uh, I dig you guys. I'm rooting hard for you guys. And uh, long may well, you run. You. Shout out to Neil Young. Long may you run. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Oh, Shout out to Neil Young. Shout out to Zellers. Thank you for having us. Yeah, good luck with the podcast. It's been yeah. great. No, thanks, yeah. man. Is there anything that uh, I didn't ask you but you wanted to share with everybody? Is there anything left on the in the vault there that you wanted to let out? Album's coming out later this year. Yeah, we got an album. That, yeah. there's, there's singles building to I don't know if we're wow. supposed to be saying that, though. Too late. Wow. I, I'm not editing this, Chase. <laughs> <laughs> That's out, why man. I was like, well, I don't know if we're putting out more music. I think... It's never a bad thing to tell people... We, it, we, what? <laughs> it's never a bad move to... Make people aware that new music is coming. I thought I think so too. I don't know why we're told that. Um, it doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know what we're doing the next little while, but something's happening. I'm sure something's happening. Just stay tuned. Follow us. Follow us on social media. Okay. So, and do you uh, do you have the handle you want to drop on people for how they can? Is it? I know I follow you on Twitter, but do you remember the handles for these uh, accounts? Um. Twitter, Jesus. Uh, uh, Beto and Soundclash with no vowels, I think. Yes. Okay. Uh, and on, then, the sound uh, clash. on the Soundclash part. <laughs> only on the Soundclash part. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me more. Bedouin, so, Bedouin yeah. Yeah. And then um, Instagram is just at Bedouin Soundclash. Uh, yeah. Come message it. You can me- Instagram is the best place to find us in terms of messaging and stuff like that. So follow them there. By the way, before I do my little outro here, my wish for you is that, and I think it's very possible with that song, uh, When the Night feels my song which is that i think it could become one of those tiktok songs like it just takes the the lightning has to strike again with the right meme or whatever in tiktok land and you know my, my kids will be telling me all about this new song they just learned and i'll be like you kids i heard that in 2005 <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right man we'll see what happens <laughs> see what happens and that Brings us to the end of our 1,082nd show. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Toronto Mike. Our friends at Great Lakes Brewery are at Great Lakes Beer. Palma Pasta is at Palma Pasta. Sticker U is at Sticker U. Doer is at Doer Performance. Ridley Funeral Home are at Ridley FH. And Canna Cabana are at Canna Cabana underscore. See you all next week.